Hi, this is Rebecca and Leslie with the Geeky Girls Night In podcast. Geeky Girls Night In is a podcast with your fandom family sleepover style. Empowering fans and creating inclusive fan spaces where we can all be ourselves. So get your jammies, grab a drink, gather the fur babies, and join the conversation. Hey, everybody. Welcome back. Thanks so much for tuning back in this week. Um, Leslie is still out being fabulous and actually Quinzel is, uh, still at TwitchCon and you should definitely check the Facebook page out. Quinzel has been posting a lot of really cool, uh, black girls game two posts and they're really fun and adorable. So, so today with me, I'm happy I have someone with me to this week doing it is Emily Timmons. Say hi. Hello. <laughs> so... <laughs> Emily is a friend of mine and Leslie's, and she's been listening and supporting our podcast like the darling human being that she is. And she's also a big old nerd. I think Star Wars is her biggest fandom, and she just loves geekiness. So she's going to chime in today with what's happening this week in her fandoms. And then later, I'm interviewing... Uh, Janelle, who has a Sipping Sisters podcast. She's a blogger and podcaster for pop culture. We talk about Timeless. We talk about yes. we talk about my crazy ex-girlfriend. We talk about Brooklyn Nine-Nine. We talk about Younger. We, I mean, we and we talk a lot about representation and uh, shipping. A lot of fun fandom stuff. So definitely stick around for that. So Emily, is this your first Hi. podcast? It is. I'm very excited to be here. Yay! We feel so honored. So, um, thanks for coming on, and thanks Thank for being for so me. awesome and supporting us because we really appreciate it. We're still trying to find our butts with our two hands sometimes, but we're having a good time <laughs> and hopefully putting things positive out there. And we just really appreciate that. Well, it's a pod put together by two of my favorite ladies. How could I not support it? Oh. <laughs> So this is where we do our uh, Weekend Geek usually, and there has been quite a few um, items about Star Wars this week. Uh, if you want to talk about that, Emily, I'll, I, I saw that the Boba Fett movie is not happening. What's going on yep. with that? Um, apparently, Kathy Kennedy, who is Kathleen Kennedy, who is the president of Lucasfilm, um, kind of confirmed that the Boba Fett movie is no longer kind of moving out of pre-production. It's, it's not really going to be moving forward at all. They're kind of throwing all their resources at this point onto John Favreau's The Mandalorian. Okay, so which... before we get to that one, why do you? Th why, did they say why they're not doing Boba Fett? Because from what I can see, he's like, um, he does have a really enthusiastic sort of cult fandom. Yes, um, for only ha having 10, 15 minutes of screen time yeah. in the in the, in the OT. Uh -huh. He has a very rabid fan base, and yeah. some of that's built around how intricate the Mandalorian culture is in the what used to be the expanded universe, the EU, okay. which kind of got the kibosh put on it when Disney bought bought out Lucasfilm. Um, okay. But they're kind of shuffling that into um, the Disney streaming universe that's going to be launching when disney starts their streaming service okay later in 2019 and one of those series that's going to be premiering is going to be the mandalorian we don't know who the mandalorian is we've only seen the armor we don't know who's in it it could be a man it could be a woman um we don't know so it's really exciting that we're getting this new mandalorian who comes from a very rich cultural heritage and we don't know who's in the armor yet so that has a huh. lot of mystique to it that's really interesting like what do we know about it what what is it even going to be about do you know there's been a really short synopsis on john Favreau. we have like a rifle that boba fett used in the comics huh. so we're kind of interested to see where that goes they have released a slate of directors for the episodes and it got a lot of kudos from a lot of people in the community because it did include a lot of women, a lot of uh -huh. people of color. So they're not just relying on white men anymore, which is a very kind of welcome change for Star Wars because it yeah. has had its inclusivity issues. So Star Wars is always a fandom that I find myself coming back to. Um, I've loved it since I was a young child and... 
existing, especially with Twitter, interacting with a lot of other Star Wars potters. And, you know, um, I'm a huge fanfic fan. Yes. So I wander my way over to, to the AO3 several times a week. And just seeing what people create, that the love of the fandom is so deep. Yeah. And the love of the characters runs so deep. They create these very intricate portrayals of characters in ways that they don't t- necessarily exist within established canon. I and love that's that always so, so fun much. To see. Do you primarily read the Star Wars fanfic or do you branch out? I branch out. I do mostly Star Wars. Um, I was on an Avengers kick. Um, I've read a couple Doctor Who's. I fell out of Who for a while, and now I'm kind of getting back in with the Thirteenth Doctor. Uh-huh. Um, so I'm a couple episodes behind. I just saw that my DVR recorded tonight's episode. Nice. Arachnids in the UK. So I'm very yes. excited to sit down and watch that. I'm loving the Thirteenth Doctor. I cannot express how wonderful she is. She really is. She's doing a tremendous job. Um, and actually, yesterday on Strictly Come Dancing, which I've heard of but I haven't watched because it's a British show. Yes. Um, one of the dancers, Stacy Dooley, honored Jodie Whittaker with her costume was the Thirteenth Doctor costume. That's so cool. And then they did a gender switching tango, so they would switch like which one was leading, I guess, That's because. Awesome. Uh, and then her dance partner was dressed as a Cyberman, which is yes. very cute. And then Mandeep Gill, the the beautiful, beautiful, even one of the new friends. Uh, who plays Yaz, she actually um, attended to support. So I thought that was super cute. The timeless movie that kind of wraps up timeless TV is filming. Where Um, are they going to play that? Is that going to be on streaming or on network or what are they going to do? It should be on NBC. And I think it has an air date of early December. Okay. I'm, I'm very excited that we're getting a wrap up movie that we're not ending just like the series ended. Yeah, that's important. I mean, I'm a Sense8 fan, and yes. we were absolutely gutted by cancellation. And it, and it was something that was really special to get the two. We had a two hour wrap up, which I think, yes. well, of course, you always want more yes. um, seasons. It's better than nothing, for sure. Yes. It's funny because so I have a, you know, I have a four year old, and so much of my geek right now is run through the lens of what my daughter watches. Um, <laughs> what does she watch? She's watched A New Hope, and she got really into uh-huh. that. Um, we were at a Trunk or Treat event tonight, and I live in Indiana where the weather swings wildly day to day. So It was like 40 and raining, so they had it inside. And we came around a corner, and she saw someone had done a Star Wars setup, and she absolutely flipped out because there was a Princess Leia. How cute. Yeah, so it's it's really fun sharing those nerdy moments with her. It really it's, is awesome. it's, If it's something that she knows that I like, like she knows that mommy likes Star Wars. And so uh-huh. she gets excited and, and look, mom, look, they're dressed like the people you love. Oh, so it's a lot like, of fun. I feel like nerdy her. parenting is, is such a great way to parent. Nerdy parenting is amazing. Because you get to really share things you get to share passions yeah. you get to connect um yeah. and my son now he's 16 and so a lot well we you know he grew up we watched Buffy together watch Angel together we watched Doctor I mean we watched anything sci-fi fantasy together went to yes. Supernatural cons comic cons and it it really was like a running thread in our life of something no matter what was going on we could bond over that yes. and now he has different fandoms you know he's a teenager <laughs> he's doing his own thing so mostly manga and anime though he also loves Spider-Man um, but just the passion with which he loves the things that he loves, I'm like, yep, I did that. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> which is pretty cool. Showing her Disney movies that I grew up on that she gets excited about yes. now are very exciting. What's her favorite Disney movie? Uh, it changes week to week. Um, right now she's really into the Emperor's New Groove. Oh, that was a solid movie. That was a good yeah. movie. It is a hysterical movie. And yes. It's one that is very rewatchable. Yes. So many, like, we, she has a little Dumbo that she carries around everywhere. It's like her safety toy. Uh-huh. And so Dumbo comes everywhere, but we hadn't actually watched Dumbo. She just had found that character and really clung to him. Uh-huh. And watching Dumbo as an adult, you're like, oh, yeah, that's super racist. And there's quite a bit of drug use. 
So. And it's depressing. <laughs> yes. Just going back and watching things that flew over your head as a kid. Yeah. As an adult, you're like, oh, okay, that makes this somewhat darker. Yeah. <laughs> Seriously. You know, I have a, a four-year-old niece and she Who loves... adorable. Oh, my God. Isn't she... Oh my Your God. pictures always make me so happy. Yes, I anti life. I'm telling you, anti life is awesome, <laughs> and she loves Moana. Yeah, we we hit the Moana stride a couple months ago, and it's good. I mean, the great thing about Disney movies, at least the the modern ones, I think, is they are so good you can enjoy them too, and you get yes. take it for granted. And then she's like. Oh, I want to watch PJ Mask, and I'm like, oh god, let's just watch Moana again, because <laughs> nothing wrong with PJ Mask, but you know, it's repetitive. It's repetitive. It's repetitive because yes. kids do yeah. like repetition. That's yeah, how they learn. The big life lessons hit you over the face with a mallet. Yeah, yeah. Like, there's only so much Mickey Mouse Clubhouse we can watch. Yeah, this is where I'm like, let's just watch that Disney movie again. Yeah, let's watch. Seriously, anything, let's watch We Wanna. Not this. Yeah, yeah. Let's watch We Wanna for the th- thousandth time. That's still gonna be better. Yeah. What does she dress as? Right. Uh, this year she's going as Fancy Nancy. Who's Fancy which Nancy? Which is a book series that got made into a fairly recent TV series on Disney Junior. Uh-huh. And so it's all about a little girl who loves to be fancy. Which <laughs> that sounds adorable. Is, which is Lily to an absolute T. Oh. And so she refused to be called by her name when she's in costume. <laughs> you have to address her as Fancy Nancy or she will not answer you. She has uh, such a personality. I always love your posts about her. She is. She's she's hysterical. And just watching the things that bring her joy, like jewelry and tiaras. And it's so funny because that was never anything I was into. Yeah. But it is, it is her jam. And that is awesome. Yeah. They've really got their own personalities. Do you guys have any Halloween traditions yet? Or is she um, kind of too little? She really just enjoys, once she figured out the whole... Uh, I go to people's houses, I say trick or treat, and they provide me with sugar candy. <laughs> yes. Once she understood that, it was like, oh, cool. We need to do this as many times as possible yes. throughout the month of October. So we do a circuit of the grandparent houses because both grandparents right now are in town. And we are getting ready to move to a different city, which will put us very close to Leslie, which I'm very excited oh, about. Oh, that's so I'm so jelly. Yes. So are you uh are you a Star Trek fan at all as well? I was a huge fan of The Next Generation. Uh-huh. Kind of grew up on Star Trek The Next Generation. Um so Picard has always been my captain. He is uh, freaking awesome. He is amazing. Yeah. Um I haven't had a chance to watch Star Trek Discovery yet, but I want to. Well, because um, CBS put it on their streaming only service, yes, like the I, biz natches they are. Right. There there was a lot of, of rage there. Uh, yes. Um, I feel a lot. I... Did uh, to... CBS and me are not okay. No, CBS has a, its own issues. Yeah. Um, I can, I can, we could do a whole episode about the Big Bang Theory and why it's mm-hmm. not good, not a good representation of geek culture. <laughs> um. Well, we, I mean, also, I mean, look at their they're um, bored right now people are getting yeah. paid to quit Absolutely. because they're sexual assaulters and yes. and misogynists and oh my god on and on and then of course they treat star trek fans like atms yes. instead of with any respect so that's my feelings on cbs yes. but um i actually brought it up because cbs has announced plans to produce an animated star trek series Ooh. called lower decks which will be the very first Star Trek comedy. It is going to be written by Mike McCann, who okay. created Rick and Morty, or writes Rick and Morty. It will follow less prominent members of Starfleet, or the people who put the yellow cartridge in the food replicator so a banana can come out the other end, unquote. <laughs> so I'll be interested to see that. Uh, yes. I don't know what it's where it's going to be, if it's also going to be on the streaming service, if, yeah. if that's the case. That's a different idea, but... Um, as a Star Trek fan, I've, I've always loved Star Trek parodies and yeah. I enjoy all the humor surrounding it as well. Yes. So another thing I want to talk about with you is Patreon. Yes. So Geeky Girls Night In, Leslie and I have a Patreon. We don't talk about it much, which we need to, we need to change that. And we haven't super developed it yet, but uh, we are planning on doing that. So 
maybe during the holiday break. So for those that don't know, Patreon is a place where you can support creators of content. Say it's a writer, a musician, podcaster, whatever. So basically, Patreon is a few things. It's a way to kind of skip the gatekeepers, the people who decide who gets to go on TV, who gets to be in movies, et cetera, et cetera. So you skip the gatekeepers because let's face it, a lot of that TV movies, it's very a very exclusive club. A lot of white people, young, skinny women, you know, like it's very particular who people get hired. And even in the publish and ind- publishing industry, um, it's very, very skewed towards white men and very much away from minorities. So to me, uh, Patreon is a place where you can support people directly. So like whenever there's a scandal and they're like this comedian or this commentator was actually a giant misogynistic douche that sexually harassed women to me i always think okay support content creators directly support commentators directly support women and people who you know are good people so to me i think patreon is a is um the opportunity to do that it's also an opportunity to build community because when you're a patron a lot of times you're part of that community you can see the posts extra content and things like that so for example, say uh, there's one podcast I listen to a lot, The Creative Pen. And so for her patrons, you know, she releases extra audio content and Q&A. And some people who are writers do like a monthly short story. So it just depends on the patron. So you can be a part of that community with the other patrons and you can get content from that person. So that's the basic idea. And we, so Emily is our first patron. So we're like super happy and grateful. (laughs) Um, And also it's a good thing to ask you, you know, and actually a lot of podcasts do, if the patrons at a certain level, they'll invite them on the podcast and chat and stuff like that. But it's a good time to ask you, since you are our um, audience of one at this point, what would you (laughs) like to see for extra content? Here's some ideas we've had. We've had extra audio as in like reviewing things. Um, well, live watches are kind of hard because people are all in different, different time zones. Uh, newsletters, although I'm not quite sure what to put in the newsletter, to be honest, um, whether it's what we were up to that week or what happened geeky that week, videos, like what, what do you, what do you think is, would be good content for an inclusive, fandom positive, geeky podcast? Um, I support several different patreons at several different levels uh-huh. i love the platform i love how it, it exactly what you said like it removes the gatekeeper you get um even if there's a lot of patrons for a certain podcast you still feel very included in what they choose to do for mm-hmm. podcasts the bonus content is always great um it can be hey we're going to do a episode by episode rewatch of supernatural uh-huh. and So we're going to review season one, episode one, and, you know, that drops exclusively for our subscribers. So like reviews. Okay. Yeah. Because I was thinking, because I've been talking about doing the Wayward Sisters episodes because I love those. Um, Also, I mean, I read a lot of fantasy books and have a lot of feelings about them. So I'm like, maybe book reviews? Book reviews are always good. Um, A book club might not be a bad idea. Ooh, that'd be so, I love the idea of a book club. You could do, um, newsletters are good, um, even if it's just a Week in Geek recap. um, Okay. Just, you know, what interests you? What interests the people who are listening? Mm -hmm. Um, Do a creator spotlight. Do interviews with creators. Creators, Um, what do you mean by that? Just... So either other podcast hosts um, put the spotlight on other... um, marginalized fandom individuals people who are running podcasts people who are putting out content be it authors or bloggers um kind of like what you do on the segments in the podcast but do like a full-length interview like 30 minutes with okay someone Um, okay it gives you guys a chance to broaden um the topics you talk about and it Uh would give your audience a chance to get introduced to new individuals that they can support as well that's a great idea because i mean we're talking to these people anyway because those are the people we want to get to know and those are the people that we yes you know so instead of having like a five minute snippet with janelle you can have like 
a 20 minute bonus content Uh where you guys just scream at each other about wayward sisters which is amazing right (laughs) yeah or we could do like one one thing we've tested out a few times is doing like rapid fire question segments yes but the we seem to have so many questions they don't usually make it in so (laughs) i could do something like that too yeah that'd be good yes see this is all good stuff yes (laughs) <laughs> I am a huge fan of Patreon and how it gives you just access to so many other levels of inclusion. I just I love it. It's such a great platform. And I do think if you like being a fan, yes. that's a way to have more meaningful connections. Yes. Um I I support also um Mark Oshiro. Mark does stuff and he's amazing. Um, and a lot of that is because, you know, he has, I think, a unique voice and he, the community he serves is a marginalized community and he, the book he wrote, um, you know, centers a boy of color and also talks a lot about issues that people don't talk enough about, like mental health, police violence, that kind of thing. So yeah, definitely. Like that's, that's kind of what I look for as well. And then also community is nice Yes. because let's face it. Social media could be a very nasty place. And sometimes it's nice to have a little it community. Absolutely, yeah. Having, having a haven, having somewhere, you know, that's your space that exists with creators that make you feel good is just wonderful. Okay. Well, thank you so much. We appreciate so, your support. I'm so glad you asked. I'm yes. so excited to be here. And so is there any other, anything else you wanted to say or talk about before we yeah. head to our interview? I'm sure there's probably something, but nothing <laughs> is popping up at the moment. Okay. And do you have a Twitter or anything you want people to follow? Sure. Um, on Twitter, it's just EM Timmons one Very original, I know. <laughs> um, and it's, I'm pretty sure it's the same thing on Instagram. And if you like seeing lots of pictures of an adorable four-year-old as she conquers the world around her, that's pretty much what my Instagram has devolved into. It's it's a good Instagram. I agree. Yes. <laughs> and if you guys want to check us out on Patreon, just search us up in, uh, in Patreon, Geeky Girls Night In. So now on to our interview. So um, as promised, we are here with the wonderful Janelle Uretha McCammick. Hey Janelle. Hey. Thanks so That's much. Been beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much for being on the podcast. I'm excited to be here. So, Yay. so we were talking before I hit record about where how we met because sometimes I met uh, meet awesome people on Twitter and then I get to the point where I'm like, wait, how do we meet? And since it wasn't Winona or Pursuit of Supernatural, we've came to the conclusion that was probably one of us searching for other Chicanas on Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> so Janelle is a Chicana loudmouth. I'm sure I saw like something like that in your bio and was like, "Add um, <laughs> who believes wholeheartedly that stories saved her life as they gave her an escape." Same. She podcasts at Sipping Sisters Podcast with her two sisters about the shit they see on their screens. She writes for Telltale t- TV and Fangirlish. Representation matters to her, and she's still on the lookout. For seeing herself represented on screen. Mm-hmm. So welcome. Yes, that's right. That's right down our alley. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so um, Leslie is out today. So it's just me. So we'll just dig right in if that's okay. Absolutely. Let's do it. So what motivated you in the first place to kind of become a blogger, a podcaster, to get into nerdy pop culture, um, I guess, commentating? Yeah, my first introduction to podcast actually came probably like a lot of other people with true crime podcasting. So I started listening to Serial and then became a very big fan of Undisclosed and other um, wrongful conviction type of work, which is something that I've been interested in since, really since I went to undergrad. Mm -hmm. Um, And that just really intrigued me. And then I... um, was home. I was staying home with my kids and I was dying. I hated it. Um, (laughs) 
<laughs> it happens. Yes, it happens. So I, I needed a project and I want to be close to my sisters. And so I just kind of fielded it out there. I was like, hey, why don't we start a podcast? And mm-hmm. we're all teachers. So at first we thought we would do a podcast about teaching, but even like we did a first run and it was like, you know, we do that all day and it's really hard to, while we're still teaching, it's really hard to like talk about as far as confidentiality, Right. you know, you don't want to, you want to talk about the juice, but you kind of can't talk about the juice when you're in it. So we all love TV and mm-hmm. we all love stories and it is a unifying thing for us as sisters. And so we thought we would talk about that and it's turned out to be such a meaningful part of my life. And I think our relationship. So it's been very interesting and we're nerds for different things. So, mm-hmm. um, my older sister, Jackie is a nerd for like romance. Like mm-hmm. she's, she's, you know, she's watched, um, soaps, and she loves the Hallmark. She's a Hallmarky, you know, Ooh. all that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. <laughs> one of my She's best, this... one of my best friends is a romance writer who just helped them launch Hallmark Publishing. So I'll have to connect oh. them. Oh my gosh, that's amazing! <laughs> <laughs> that's phenomenal. <laughs> Yeah, so she's she's really into that stuff. And then um, Rachel is my younger sister is a sports and I would say kind of like political junkie. Mm-hmm. So she she nerds out for that kind of stuff. And and she has a couple of like she's also a nerd for Harry Potter. So who is so it? those are kind of her fandoms, mm-hmm. I would say. And then I'm kind of all over the place, I suppose. I um I'm in that uh, kind of law nerd space for sure. Um, But then also, you know, just get really invested and kind of like, I guess, feminist or like, Uh you know, the even when they're not feminist, when they're the the leading women. So that's kind of my bag. Me too. Yes. (laughs) I mean, Winona Earp, come on. Yes. (laughs) Yes. So that's kind of what drew us. And I think we've just gotten nerdier as it's gone on, which is (laughs) fantastic. (laughs) You know, um, one thing that I've noticed that I think is really cool as a part of sort of, you know, podcasting is getting bigger, more people are doing it, is what I love about your story is, you know, we had um, Two Squares podcast on. They're a married couple and they did a podcast to sort of bond and spend time together talking about things they love. So I love that podcasting is, it's not only for reaching out to an audience, it's also for like connecting and bonding with the people you love in your life. I think that's really cool. Absolutely. And I've never talked so regularly and deeply to my sisters ever in my life. Um, And it's, you know, that's pretty incredible. It it really is. It's And it's something that we'll always have that we created together. I mean, that's pretty profound in in some ways. Absolutely. I love it. I think that's beautiful. (laughs) Yeah. So I know you also blog um, about the blogs or your podcast. What are your favorite shows right now to recap and review? Because I see you working on on some... On a couple of different shows. So what what's your favorites to review right now? Right now I am just head over heels for Crazy Ex Girlfriend. Yes. <laughs> oh my goodness. It 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 not it didn't lose me, but last season, season three, I just had some issues with the way that they were focusing on Rebecca, who's the main character. <laughs> um, <laughs> yep. <laughs> and they just have like I actually tweeted at some point about that and um, Rachel Bloom, who is the, is a co-creator star writer, just like, I mean, one of the most incredible people on the planet. Mm -hmm. She basically messaged and said, don't worry. Like we're going to cover all this stuff that you're concerned about. Uh And so I I did, I was like, okay, I trust you. That's really cool. That's really cool that she, she uh, connects with the fans like that. Yeah. I, I was, I did a dance. <laughs> like, oh my gosh, Rachel Bloom. Ah. <laughs> She's really awesome. She's really awesome. I saw her in the bathroom at Comic-Con and yes. it was amazing. 
<laughs> I love random Comic Con stories like that. Oh my gosh! Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so um, this season, you're just really loving uh, recapping those episodes. Then. Definitely, and it's it's a hard show to review because two types of shows are hard for me to review. Like when I just I have such um, complicated thoughts that I want to write a thesis, but you have. <laughs> less than 24 hours to do it uh, yes. you know so it's like I just it never gets to like the level of eloquence and like like analysis that I want and it's so frustrating <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um and then the other ones that are kind of hard to write is when it's just like which I find with Brooklyn Nine-Nine that happens mm-hmm. which is basically my view is I liked this and I liked this and I liked this yeah. and that was funny and this was good and yes, I like that yeah, too yeah. <laughs> but that's a good problem to have right it is it totally is um i i don't review it but of the things that i'm watching right now that i just really am loving is all american that hasn't i haven't i got like i heard like no hype about it and then it's um it's on the cw and it's kind of like are you watching that no i don't think i heard of it what's that I, yeah i hadn't really i had like I just saw it on like the list of new fall TV. And then I feel like it really hasn't been advertised, which ugh, yeah. I don't know why networks make that decision sometimes, but don't get me um, started on the CW. Oh my gosh. I know it's so hard. <laughs> it's such a complicated relationship. Yes. It gives me these things I adore. And then I just get so ticked off. Uh, yeah. It's very complicated. Yes. <laughs> I, I agree. But, um, so what's that one about then? So it's kind of like if Friday Night Lights and mm, like, a you know, it's like CW hot. So it'd be like if Friday Night Lights and (laughs) Pretty Little Liars had a baby. Okay. Kind of. Oh, Um, I think I heard of it then because it's like a sports focused show, right? Yeah. I think that's why it just went in here out the other because I don't ever watch anything sports related. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yeah. I, I don't tend to. I don't. Well, I loved Pitch. Oh, my gosh. Oh, yeah, didn't I'm that so only mind. get one season? It only got one GD season. And, <laughs> oh, my oh, God. Yeah, I heard so great things about it. Oh, tragedy. Oh. But, um, yeah, so it, it is sports-focused, but like Friday Night Lights, it's really about the relationships and about neighborhood and about... Um, you know, kind of family and found family. And there are just a couple Mm -hmm. characters that I am just so excited to be watching. So the the one that I think I'm the most excited to be watching is this character Coop. And she's a gay woman who is masculine expressing. Mm -hmm. And she just had her kind of coming out story a little bit on the last episode. Sorry, spoiler. Um, (laughs) But it's it, it was really fascinating because it was basically one of those things where she's like, it's so clear that I'm gay. Like, have you met me? But she has to kind of <laughs> explicitly say that to her mom. Right. Um, and then her mom rejects her. Aww. And uh, yeah, it's it's it, it was it was hard to watch, but it was just it was really beautifully done. And I thought really unexpected in this like CW sports drama. Right, right. So they're they're doing some really good stuff on that show. So um, I definitely awesome. recommend it. I wish that there were more Latinx characters because, like, it's set in L.A. And I haven't mm, yeah. yet to see a Latinx character. I'm like, come on. I don't yeah. care where you are. If you're in Beverly Hills, if you're uh, in Crenshaw. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah that, yeah, that will always drive me nuts about shows. Yes. Like, you know, the you know infamous ones like mad about you in San Francisco and there were no Asian mm. people mm-hmm. and then like mm-hmm. how white <laughs> friends was and you're like you literally created a fake version of this city and erased all the people of color what is wrong yes. with your mind like that's why I kind of get in I get frustrated because we always have to talk about inclusivity and diversity. And I'm like, why don't they have to talk about exclusivity and erasure? Like they should be, instead of us having to sell and defend the idea of diversity, they should be having to defend and sell the idea of erasure because it's creepy when you're like, okay, you sat there and imagined a completely fictional land and we're not in it, but Mm -hmm. we're right here. Like, what does that say about that person? You don't see us. You don't want us to be there. You know, it's just kind of, I don't know kind of creepy that was a side tangent though but actually (laughs) actually leads to my next question which is you know we both are people who care about representation so 
So the CW, especially, there's a lot of shows right now trying to, I think because the landscape for shows right now is so vast, there's like over 450 shows at any given time now with all of the options people have. People are trying to get uh, attention by going a little more niche and Mm -hmm. more people are trying to be diverse, I think. And I think sometimes, and the CW can be, can be like this, but um, it, it comes across as tokenism, right? They're just kind uh-huh. of like, oh, here's, you know, here's this brown person, but it's it's done in a very tokeny way. So if you, you know, as someone who cares about representation, what do you look for in a show? Like, how can you tell they're actually telling diverse stories as opposed to engaging in tokenism? Like, well, how do you, what do you look for to tell the difference? So a, a tough question because I I don't know that I I look out for authentic representation. It's more it's easier to know when it's the opposite. Yeah, <laughs> you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's true. <laughs> because I think that's the sign of the good representation is it's not waving its arms at you saying, "Hey, look at I'm including Latinx. Look yeah, at yeah, me. Yeah. Look at me." Right. You know, um, which I think Crazy Ex Girlfriend is doing really well right now. Yeah. I think that I think that it, it is that okay, so um to all the boys I loved before, uh-huh. for me just hit this nerve of representation. And I am, you know, not um Korean or Asian at all. Um, but I think that the way that that like met a need for me to like see myself represented is kind of how she was like kind of saw herself as being brushed aside and mm-hmm. not like the in crowd uh-huh. and how that story made her the in crowd. And it didn't, it didn't, you know, it, it didn't like make it cute. And like, um, I mean, it was a very cute movie, but it didn't make, it didn't make her identity the like, package of a few items that could show that that's how she was different right she she was was, nuanced or layered or exactly and it was about her character and I and I think that that's kind of how you know is like could you is this person this character more than right their identity markers because you know white characters especially straight white male characters they they get to be seen as telling universal stories. It doesn't focus on their identity. So like when you tell a universal story with a character that is fully fleshed out, um, I think that's, that's your ideal. I know one thing that I do, and this is a little harder to find out, but I like to see if they're, if the writing room is diverse. Yes. Because that's how you can tell sometimes that it's window dressing. And then as you mm-hmm. watch it, you it's painfully obvious. Yep. But a lot of times it goes back to who's in the writing room. If you're just trying to get the visual, but not sort of any authenticity to the experience, that's usually where it shows. So um, there was, I'm trying to remember the hashtag not long ago, it was show, uh, mm-hmm. show your writing room. Mm-hmm. And it was very telling, like who did and who didn't tweet pictures yep. of their yep. writing room. Yep. <laughs> because and and it also the shows that did tweet pictures of their writing room, you went, oh yeah, see, you mm-hmm. know that show comes across as very natural and authentic. You know, in its diversity, that's because the writing room's diverse. So I think that even though that's harder to find out, sometimes I think that's a really big indication. I totally agree. I also think this is a little strange maybe, but um, if you look at the ships mm-hmm. and shipping and, and caring about ships, it's a convoluted territory, <laughs> but to say the least, It can right? be beautiful <laughs> and it can be terrible. It Just can be both. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that, I think that like, although I you know, fall at the feet of Rob Thomas because Veronica Mars is one of my very, very favorite shows of all time. And uh-huh. um, Veronica and Logan are one of my favorite ships of all time. He has a, <laughs> he I'm has one of the few people that's like, uh, but we can talk about that at the time. 
Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> no, that's good. Um, but I, when I look at that show and then I look at I Zombie and I look at some other shows, I look at Timeless, uh-huh. like the, the ships that are prominent mm. are white and the white lead ship, the person, right? So, mm-hmm. so Veronica or Liv, it like become, there's this like tone of preposterousness mm-hmm. if she was to be with a non-white person, right? So like Veron- let's, for Veronica Mars, like Veronica uh-huh. has Wallace in her life as right. her best friend. Who's She's got freaking Weevil amazing. in her life. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Who's like, you know, the like sassy kind of, I mean, definitely we've got some racialized <laughs> right, stuff. Right, 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 right. Like for yeah. sure. Um, but, you know, has that kind of like, mm, they have like a sexy interaction. Right. But we never get a whiff that they yeah. are romantic possibilities for her. Right. And yet every white guy who like comes on that, even like for like a cameo, <laughs> suddenly is like potential love interest for Veronica. Uh-huh. So that shows something that who our characters are allowed to be sexy with, who they see as sexy and, uh-huh. and love or sex interests, uh-huh. that matters. And we're not looking at it enough. And it comes to mind for Timeless, even though Timeless is like in many ways a very inclusive show. Mm-hmm. The lead ship that's like all over is Lucy and Wyatt, even though right. if you watch the show, the, the first couple to actually be established canon is is Rhea, is, just, is, is Rufus and Gia. Uh-huh. But they nev- they don't get any of the... Uh-huh. I mean, it's it's and it's like fake to me. It's like fake. It's like, oh yeah, and we love Rhea, but no, 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 you're yeah. not, you're not, you're not getting the feels. You're mm-hmm, isn't getting it as involved. Yeah, and it's it's because I think of our biases that we still bring to these shows. So same yeah. thing with like Liv and Ravi on uh-huh. I Zombie, and you know, I I ship them, and I and sometimes I bring that up, and it's like, I think that we're so entrenched in our ideas of race mm-hmm. and particularly when it comes to what men get sexualized that, right. you know, Asian men, South Asian men, they just, just don't get to be sexy. They don't get yeah. to be the leading love interest. And right. same is true for, um, you know, Asian yeah. women, Latinx women, uh-huh. it, they're, they're either, you know, they're just put in these traditional stereotypical yeah. roles of either being highly sexualized, but not yeah. seen as a relationship or all these other things. So I think we can look at ships yeah. for knowing about shows that care about representation and can do it well. Well, and what I find interesting about that, um, and actually I watched iZombie for maybe, I think I watched the whole first season I might have. Um mm-hmm. And I I just get distracted quickly because there's so many shows I want to watch. But oh, um, what's so, um, yeah, because her best friend, the doctor, and mm-hmm. which, what's his name? Ravi. Ravi, yeah. Mm-hmm. He's absurdly hot. And so. He's absurdly hot. Yeah. And actually, the, <laughs> so I watched it like, meh, maybe. Oh God, like a year ago. And then I just kind of wandered off because that's how I am. Mm -hmm. But um, Ravi, the actor who plays him, Rahul Kohli, he's on Twitter. And I was cracking up because he was getting some kind of, you know, some kind of hate on Twitter about being unattractive or whatever. And someone told him, (laughs) um, oh, there's something like there's, fruit sellers on the street of India that look the same as you or something like that. And he he tweeted like, we have some very fuckable fruit vendors then or something like that. But (laughs) I literally get in my feelings, like, are these people literally blind? But the thing that I, but I wonder as you're talking about this, so what part are the writers and showrunners and what part of that, are the fans. So is it the way it's written and presented or is it the fans that have this internalized bias because, or maybe it's a little bit of both because honestly, so with Winona Earp, you have, mm-hmm. you know, like the most progressive showrunner and writing room probably in existence. They're writing, you know, incredibly well LGBT characters. It's very feminist and all that. Mm-hmm. Um, 
but the fa- but and I love the fandom. It's one of the most inclusive, wonderful fandoms of, around. But you do see that the characters of color, their ships, and they, they're just mm-hmm. the art, the gifts. It, they're not really. You don't ever see them show up, and you're like, "Am I? Am I losing my mind?" Because mm-hmm. you know that person is absurdly hot, or that person is really interesting. You know, so. I don't know like how much of it is the show and how much of it's the fandom. And a lot of times it's not, you know, it's not necessarily conscious or purposeful at all, but it's so different than what I'm experiencing that weirds me out. Yeah. I think that there's something strange that goes on in fandoms and probably then it is what you're talking about. This like symbiotic, you know, exchange that happens with the creators as well. But there's something strange that happens where you watch something, you consume it, and you kind of have the thought, that person's good looking. Uh-huh. And, or, or, ooh, they or whatever. They have great whatever. chemistry or, yeah. Yeah. But if it's not validated, if you don't feel uh-huh. like that's a reasonable response, mm-hmm. you know, that you're basically going to have people be like, yeah, me too. Like, that's something I'm, I'm with you there it kind of fades away because you feel like, oh, I must not be watching this right. (laughs) You're right. You're absolutely right. When you get, when you go, I think that's when fandom gets really strong is when you go on somewhere and you see people reacting in a similar way to you, it strengthens and validates it. And you Mm -hmm. start going down the rabbit hole of that fandom in a way you might not have otherwise. So absolutely. So Mm -hmm. it is like this weird little bit isolating feeling where you're like, are you kidding me? That is literally the sexiest person on that show or that person has a fascinating right. background. Why, why aren't you doing any fan out of that person? It's, it's a little bit, I don't know. It's a little odd of a experience, you know? Mm. Definitely. And speaking of fandoms, that goes to my next question, which is what are you two favorite? I'm going to say I gave you two instead of one, because I know you can't, it's hard to pick these things, mm-hmm. but two of your favorite fandoms right now. And why? I mean, there's a lot that goes into making a fandom awesome. Mm-hmm. Um, so explain why. Ooh. Okay. So we're going to talk about the timeless fandom in a little bit. So I'm, okay. I think I'm going to actually kind of put that to side because I have a few feelings about it, okay. but I think that my, um, my favorite fandoms are, gosh, it's, it's really hard, but I think right now it's the Brooklyn nine, nine fandom uh-huh. and the crazy ex-girlfriend fandom. Uh, uh-huh. Because I think for both of those shows, it's so emotional mm. about about just finally seeing something akin to what you've experienced in your life on screen. Yes. You know, Rosa's, you know, Rosa's coming out story and the way that she was able to, you know, be Rosa and be bisexual and say over and over, I'm bisexual and the way that you know, that whole game night storyline of oh, like, it was beautiful. Oh my God. Oh my God. So beautiful. <laughs> yes. Um, and Stephanie Beatriz got to like give input on that and form it. And you can see, you can see it. Oh, I know. I know. Yep. Yep. <laughs> Absolutely. It's all the feels. Yeah. I know. Exactly. And the nine, nine fandom, I think are just so, I don't know, there's something like delightfully dorky about them and uh, you know, but that it is, it's just it's like so thirsty. Yeah. Um. <laughs> <laughs> but also overflowing with love, like you you know, because I yeah. love Brooklyn Nine and I follow everybody and I'm I would consider myself kind of part of that fandom. And you see all the all the memes are just people drowning in hearts. It's hilarious. Mm-hmm. Exactly. <laughs> it's overwhelmingly positive. And yeah. even you know, here and going to, I, I, w- I went to the panel at, at, at Comic-Con and I actually got to ask a question, which was really Oh cool. my God. I watched, I, I'm jealous. I, I'm trying to think. I don't think I was able to go to the panel because I had it so late at night and we had yeah. our wayward cocktails, which I'd already bought tickets for. I did yes. watch it online though. So which question did you ask? Which one was you? I wanted to know. <laughs> oh gosh. Um, it, it, I don't know how it came out, but basically I was asking about, um, how being on the show has changed their or impacted their idea of family. Oh, that's a great question. (laughs) And um, at at the time I was wearing a dress that had um, 
so I was wearing a dress and then I had like really awkwardly and, and I, I'm not that great at, I get, I have the good ideas, but then the execution is poor. <laughs> but <laughs> I had the names of, um, Latinx characters and then their, um, real names on like either side of my dress. Okay. Uh-huh. And so I had, it was like in pink and, and, mm-hmm. you know, it was very clear that it was a, a bunch of ladies. And then on the right. back I had, you know, that, these Latinx, uh, they were all women, women actors still have not been paid what their white male counterparts have were paid last year, uh-huh. right? Because of that pay gap. Uh-huh. And so I like walked up to ask my question and Andy Samberg was like, Oh, this one's for me. And so, and which got a laugh because clearly it wasn't. Uh, okay. Though. I was like, wait, why would you up yeah, like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so like he bantered with me and I just died. Yeah. He's <laughs> darling. Um, but they had really interesting responses, and I would be interested to hear more about that just because, you know, what I was thinking is is uh, mothers are so shut out of Hollywood mm-hmm. in, in a lot of different ways. And I was interested to hear how, you know, having children while being on the show had kind of, you know, yeah. impacted them. And mm-hmm. if that was a which, – which is not the specific question I asked. So I, I would be interested to know more about that, but – I just love, I love how I really just seemed like every single person up there on that panel and involved with Brooklyn, Brooklyn Nine-Nine's creation is conscientious. Mm -hmm. And I think they make mistakes. I'm sure that they do. Right. And it, it just seems like they're humble enough to, to care about doing better and and to getting the story right and to doing a good job and making us laugh. And so... You know, I think the fandom feels that, that, that authenticity, yes. that like openness. And they makes a know. huge difference in the fandom. It makes a difference, I think, in how fans treat one another. Yes. Because yes. when, you know, any being critical in a fandom is always, it's sketchy. It could go bad. And I think if the creators feel attacked by a critique, then the other fans will attack each other, you yes. know? Yes. Um, but I, it also says a lot about Mike Schur shows. Yes. <laughs> so now I'll just watch anything he creates, like The Good Place Me too, too um, and uh, Parks and Rec. All those fandoms, I think, have been really, really positive, awesome fandoms. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, Crazy oh Ex-Girlfriend, I'm not as familiar with that fandom. Kind of what? So it's a much more like, um, I think it's just a small, a small fandom. Mm hmm. But very yeah. dedicated. I read her because uh, I, I, even though I've only watched a first the first few episodes, I love Rachel Bloom, so I follow her on everything. And she, I read that she said, like, basically the people who started watching the first season are the same people watching now. It hasn't grown, but she said it hasn't decreased. Like the people who are in it are freaking in it. <laughs> yeah, kind of cool. Yes, which is yes, that seems exactly right. And you know, they did a tour. So, I mean, this show is incredible because they do, it's a musical comedy drama. I mean, it's incredible. Uh And just the amount of material that they cover and create from Mm -hmm. from a creator's perspective, I mean, really. And they did, yeah, they did a tour. And so I I went to the show. That's so cool. (laughs) Yeah. And so things like that, to me, are like the fan. I mean, you can just see everybody there, like, so excited and like, I don't know, like, you know, that that feel in the room of, like, yeah. everybody is excited about this nerdy theater um, critique on society show. Right. Um, and getting to be together, these... yeah. Exactly, exactly. So I, I think that that's, um, I think that that's really um, important. And, and I, you know, I, th- I think that there was maybe one time where a review that I wrote or a conversation I was having on Twitter kind of went in the area of like, you know, that you, you've offended me and I offended someone because I kind of like the way that I was describing something placed blame on somebody with mental health or, or was kind of stigmatizing, um, which I'm sure, you know, of course I'm not above. Um, I don't intentionally, of course, but you know, I don't understand everything and I'm bound to offend. Yeah. But it was just a, a like, I think that the, probably the, that person were both still following each other. Like, it's not, mm-hmm. it was, it wasn't like, it was just trying to inform. Yeah. And and it wasn't, it was like coming from a really like, that's such a, um, 
uh, zinging spot, right? Like our mental mm-hmm. health, these, these really hard things that we go through yeah. and, and trying to provide really authentic perspectives on, on multiple different sides of an issue. It's hard to talk about. And, and I yeah. just respect that this fandom, you know, it's just, it doesn't ever feel stigmatizing or like, it doesn't ever feel like, ew, like, yeah. ew, you're ew. <laughs> for being this way or that way. It right. just never feels like that. And sometimes I've, I have experienced that in other fandoms. Yeah. So, well, and that show is also um, celebrated for how they depict mental health because they mm-hmm. really did. And actually, so I, tr- I watched, I don't know, like maybe four or five episodes uh, because mm-hmm. I have a friend who's a huge fan and uh, she, she has since moved to the East coast. So I haven't watched anymore, but mm-hmm. cause I, I wouldn't have necessarily watched it because I am really hardcore sort of sci-fi fantasy mm-hmm. and maybe murder. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but mm-hmm. like, other than that, I probably <laughs> won't try it. Mm-hmm. 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 But I thought it was a brilliant show, but I also found it was hard to watch because it was so real. It was like mm-hmm. so accurate that yeah. you go, you just, I mean, I don't know about you, but I would just cringe. But, oh, I remember doing those things. Like you think about high school or when, yes. you know, you're younger and you just made these just seemingly <laughs> horrendous choices. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and kind of the obsessiveness or the anxiety mm-hmm. or all the things that go into making the kind of decision that she makes in the first flip and episode. Totally, totally. I mean, and which meant to me that it was brilliant, but it it hit a little too close to home. (laughs) (laughs) But um, yeah, I love her a lot and I follow her and everything. So yeah, and she does such a good job of showing that. She's so fearless in her acting. I think everyone on the cast is just incredible. And in particular, Rachel Bloom, she just, she does. She just goes there and she really shows how it is. And, and something that I think is really profound about that representation in particular, that to me, um, the show unreal did, which you probably also didn't watch because it's, it's not fantasy. It's right. very much, it's like reality show within a reality show, uh-huh. which is weird. Um, but it, it allows women's bodies to be real bodies and not right. sex objects. So like she, not just she, the, the show it's like, yeah. you know, like uh, Valencia sings this whole song. That's basically a poop. Um, you know, a poop pun. <laughs> this is my movement about her being constipated. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I, like, I yes, have seen the is. sexy getting ready song. That was yes, amazing. Sexy yeah. re- exactly. You know, and, and she masturbates and like, <laughs> she, you know, gets a UTI and like, you know, her body, it, it, it's, it's something that men's bodies have been joked about and been able to yeah. p- portray and are constantly yeah. talking about. And women haven't because we're not, we're still on screen. We're just not full human beings. Right. So that's been no, really, you, really, really great. You guys really are supposed to be to sex objects. You can't be a real person. Yeah. Exactly. Totally. You can't fart. You can't like yeah. have act yeah. meet yourself. Exactly. Yeah. And uh, mm-hmm. well, the thing I think that impressed me just the first ep- few episodes that I did watch was, you know, Valencia was like the skinny yoga teacher, the sexy Latina. And I guess, you know, you just expect in shows like that, that she becomes a little demonized and they become friends, you know, oh, like, yeah. and that they, they don't like she's jealous of her. Right. But almost immediately she starts realizing what an asshole she is for being so jealous of her and they actually become friends. And I'm like, that is so freaking refreshing because I really Mm. expected her to be like, I don't know the, you know, the, the sexy Latina who eventually goes away as she gets the guy, you know what I mean? And so I was like, okay, the Mm -hmm. show, you can tell right away. The show's different, you know? Definitely. Valencia is probably my favorite character and she will probably for somewhat obvious reasons, I guess, but she, <laughs> she's so fascinating because she's had such a journey, which is so important in development, yeah. but she's this character that I also feel like we don't see that much who is like almost overly sincere. Uh-huh. Like she really doesn't under, she has, she has like kind of low social IQ basically. Uh-huh. Like she, like there's this one episode where she goes in and she's like, talk she she wants to be on the bridesmaid team what are those called bridal party yeah. and uh, <laughs> bridesmaid <laughs> the bridal team i like that <laughs> this 
passport. Yes. And she's there and she's like talking and she's like, oh, I'm really working on my humor. I looked up some YouTube videos. <laughs> You know, like about how to tell a joke. Like she, she's so, yeah. she's just so sincere, right? That like she, she's too blunt, and she kind of doesn't get, right. she doesn't get why people aren't like okay with that. Where she's like, no, that's you know, she's so forward about it, right? And I think that's really important because that's not being mean, yeah. Like the, you know, we kind of mistake that, and what an interesting character to have. Yeah. And kind of back to what we were talking about before about like authentic representation, like that's not a stereotype of Latinas. Right. You know, like, right. I, I don't think if anything, it's that they're conniving and kind right. of like, you know, they know how to like turn the head. Or whatever. Right. They're the neck and all that right. crap. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, to have her layered like that. And also just as far as um, relationships between women and how they're portrayed, um, I think it's all it's important. To, it's really cool to see someone idealize someone oh they have it all together they're perfect and then you get to know them and obviously that's not nobody does you know so I think it just adds a whole whole nother layer rather than just having this cardboard cut out you know which Definitely. I thought was cool so I thought I would move to the topic of timeless I know because I listened to the episode that Sip and Sisters have had I think the showrunner of Timeless on that's right. That is so Erica cool. Came on, I know she was awesome. She's that is fantastic. so cool. I love seeing shows. And like Malcolm that. Barrett, who yes. if you don't follow on Twitter, oh my gosh, he's one of my favorite Twitter followers. I love, I love him. It is, it is so lovely when people engage with their fans like that. So that was really cool. Yes. I listened to that. Now I'd heard of Timeless initially because I'm a Supernatural fan, yes. and um, Eric Kripke obviously he's creative Supernatural. So this was like his next show. Um. I hadn't watched it. I don't have it. It takes me a while to get around to stuff because I have to be on streaming. I don't have cable. Mm -hmm. Um, But um, so I've, I think I've only seen the premiere now. I also am not always hugely into time travel shows for various Mm. numbers of reasons, but um, it does look really cool. So tell me what you like about it and kind of how this, I know there's a campaign right now to save it or maybe the campaign's over. Tell me, tell me how it is. When I was at Comic-Con, I saw that big ass banner. (laughs) <laughs> yes yeah so the save timeless campaign is definitely still up and running we were able to get a film so a mm. two-hour movie is coming out december 20th so definitely so cool. yeah it's a super exciting and the timeless fandom is tireless and so committed and they've done all sorts of different like i i i'm definitely part of the fandom and i um I don't, I, I'm not in charge of anything and all I do is give money. So uh-huh. I will put that out there. And right, I wear right. t-shirts and stuff, but, but that is the extent. I, and I teach timeless in my classroom. So, uh, but yeah, I'm yeah. very, very, very small potatoes. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, so that I think came about after the banner at, at Comic-Con and after different efforts to really showcase and, and save this series. Mm. And I think that the reason the reason why I connect with this show is how it makes history alive and mm. relevant and breathing. And it gives us these characters that also care about history. And they mm. are interested in that question of fate and you know, if you could go back in time and change slavery, like, would you, knowing mm-hmm. that it could change everything, would it be worse? Is it? And, and those are such fun, fascinating questions t- to think about. And mm-hmm. I'm not really a time travel person either, but this is less time travel and more about history. Okay. And I do love history. And I love the untold stories. I'm I'm mildly obsessed with (laughs) trying to kind of uproot those for young people and show them that there have always been, there have always been women of color at the heart of social change, but we don't hear about them. Right. So I also just like the, the, you know, the, the kind of like slick, um, I don't know that the, like there's like montages and they have like all these fun pop culture references. And, you know, I like some of those shiny things and shows. Yeah, sure. And then I, I do think that the cast does this great job of interacting with fans in particular, Malcolm Barrett. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, so those are some of the reasons to watch and it, it's really a fantastic show right now. 
they're actually the Save Timeless campaign is um, I think that they already bought it and they're continuing to raise money, I think, to maybe continue the run of a huge billboard in Times Square in New York City. Uh That said, you know, that has saved Timeless, Let's Get Rufus Back, and um, and then probably has the date of the film. Okay. So, so I'm I'm like referencing to the left because as you like, (laughs) as you look at like that that huge, you know, the theater area in in Times Uh Square or whatever, that it's going to be like on this big thing to the left. So, um, which obviously would depend on your vantage point, but. It's it's really a very active fandom. The, the problem in the fandom, which you didn't necessarily ask about, but that I'm struggling with my right now, mm-hmm. is that there are these like stupid shipper wars, mm-hmm. and it's such a funny thing. And I, I'm I'm not I'm I'm not I don't engage in it, but I don't know. It's such a strange thing when you're like, look, like it's it's. Basically, there are people who are saying, you don't get to tell the writers how to write the story. Uh-huh. So if your ship isn't included, shut up, you cry, baby, and oh, like, no. go away. Oh, no. And that's coming from people Come who on. have, yeah. I know, coming from people who have seen their ship represented. Right. And, and I under, I like, I just am not of the mindset that you don't get to critique the writers. I am there to critique the writers all day long. Right. I consume this. I get to have a say. If they uh-huh. listen, that's up to them. But I get to raise a stink however I'd like. I, that's how I feel. As long as I'm not, you know, I mean, there's a difference, right? Yeah, yeah. Like, I can't be racist or bigoted or, like, you know, I mean. But I get, you. I can provide critique. Yeah. Right? And and I think that that's perfectly fine. It's good to express what you would like to see in the show. And I do think that it makes a difference. Otherwise, we would still have Kill Your Gays. Yeah. Right? Like, yeah. you ha- that, that comes from people being, saying, hey that's not, that's not okay. Right. You need to also, you know, you are baiting us. Yeah. You, you, can, you know, that is important. Yeah. I don't think that's exactly what's going on in the timeless fandom. I think that there's like a less popular ship and a more popular ship. And they're just, I just, I just, it makes me so sad yeah. because on one side, there's like a lot of gaslighting where it's basically like, Oh, you be quiet. You're just but like, if the shoe mm-hmm. was on the other foot, then like they would be doing the same thing. And like just a lot of, nonsense what yeah, is up with that I, uh, I don't get it because I'm of the opinion that sail all the ships like I have ah! my ships you have yours I sincerely believe we. it's entirely possible to live and let live mm-hmm. and I think having people critique and engage with a piece of art means that art is important it means yeah. it has impact it means it matters otherwise why would I be engaging so of course I have I guess compassion for writers because it's got to be hard to put something together so fast every week and of course Mm -hmm. it's not going to be perfect but I think um that's what that's why we have fan fiction that's why we have fan videos I mean Mm -hmm. it that piece of art impacted someone and they're reimagining it they're reinterpreting it or they're saying here, this is what we'd love to see because let's face it, you know, TV is still, you know, there's still a lot of issues in a lot, you know, in a lot of ways. So have your say in a respectful way. Like just let everybody, oh my God, you know, I, I have a few Facebook groups, um, one for Supernatural Wayward Sisters, one for um, Dom Squad, which is for Dominique Provost Chocolate, who's Waverly Earp, Winona Earp. Mm-hmm. But I've had the Supernatural one for years now. I mean, we've been like, I don't know how long we've been going now, like six years. We've literally never had any problems because the number one Mm. rule at the top that I tell literally everyone who's added is if you don't like it, you keep scrolling. That's it. Mm -hmm. You know, and Mm -hmm. don't pee on somebody's Wheaties. Just post the thing you love. And I know that it can be more complicated than that. But most of the time, it's actually not that complicated (laughs) exactly exactly um, yeah I had to kind of take a step back from a younger kind of fan group that I was in because uh, younger is a show that's 
very shippy and I love yeah. it. It's so fun. What's that to show me, about? The... I've seen you tweet about it. What's that one about? Oh my gosh, I love it. <laughs> um, so it's about this woman who g- goes back into the workforce when she's about 40 because her daughter is off to college and her husband, like she gets a divorce because her husband has gambled away all of their stuff and is like cheating oh, on no. her. Okay. And so she goes back to editing and she realizes when she tries to get a job that basically there's a lot of age discrimination. And so she's not getting hired. Okay. And so she pretends to be younger. Okay. So she pretends to be about like 15 years younger. She, she pretends to be like 27. Uh-huh. And so she gets hired as a thinking that she's 27. Uh huh. And so it's kind of about following that lie and how that lie impacts her relationships and her career and trying to keep it up. And and then as different people find out about it, how that kind of how that impacts her life and and their lives. And so um, it's it's a it's um, Sutton Foster, who's like a Broadway star and was in um, Bunheads, I believe. Um, It's a very beloved cult show itself. Yes, exactly. Mm-hmm. She's probably the only person on the planet who could actually play this role because you were like, yeah, mm-hmm. she looks like she could be both 40 and 27. <laughs> <laughs> that takes some doing. Totally. <laughs> uh... um, but she basically starts dating on the show. She starts dating this guy who is 27, mm-hmm. who who thinks that she's younger, who eventually finds out that she's not. And um, his name is Josh. And then her boss at work is somebody she's like really attracted to. And she, his name is Charles. And so there's basically team Charles and team Josh. Okay. And um, that's all fine and good. Um, But just in my interactions with some of the, some of the fandoms, it's like it, but, and I'm team Charles, but like by being on team Charles, it was like, you had to hate. Right. Right. Josh. And everybody who was, like, in the team, Josh, yeah. and, like, call him abusive. And, like, I'm, like, okay, okay, yeah. okay. <laughs> That's how I feel. I'm, like, dude, I want him to get, I, like, I'm, I mean, and I'm kind of like you. Like, I'm, like, look, if they want to, like, bang and, you know, like, I want to see everybody get together with everybody. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Ultimately, like, I'm, this is my favorite relationship. But, right. like, I'm not, you know, it's not, yeah. I don't know. There's just something about it. You, you don't, don't have to hate, hate the others. Yeah. Exactly. And and it was yeah. like, and, and they, it wasn't, you know, these, I, I like these people for sure. And, and I, they, their fan videos and, like, their stuff is so awesome. But it's just occasionally it got into it. And, and I think in particular for me, it got into anybody who would get in the way of their ship. So there's this uh, other character, Kelsey, played by Hillary Duff, and uh, they would just like go after her oh and like God. call her like a whiny bitch. And I'm like, whoa, oh, whoa, whoa. What? And, oh, and just kind of God. have these goggles on where they couldn't yeah. see these other characters for their like, you know, I don't know. It was just really vitriolic. And I'm, I'm not here for that. No. Yeah, I, I find that. Well, because the two the two shows where I have the most followers and mutuals is Winona Earp and Supernatural and Mm -hmm. Supernatural is definitely the one I found that Winona Earp there is, you know, there's different ships, but it's pretty respectful. Um, Supernatural. I, maybe it's been on because it's been on for so many years or because uh, kind of the, the divide between the creators and producers and the fans when it comes to LGBT relationships and stuff, mm-hmm. but yeah. it, you kind of have to walk on eggshells because if you say you like one, mm-hmm. the assumption becomes that you hate the other. <laughs> and I don't. So yeah, it does become really odd. And it, you know, sometimes you do have to kind of protect your, your sanity and just take a step back and that's okay too. Yeah. That's okay. Yeah, totally. I could probably do a whole episode on protecting yourself from fandom wank and how to do it. Yeah. No. Yeah, you should. <laughs> because it, it, it it's like, a, it is, it's really hard. It's, yeah. It can be hard because it's like, before you know it, you've stepped in it. Yeah. yeah. Like, oh, whoa. Whoa. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How did I get here? <laughs> yeah, I totally. don't uh, Mm. yeah and so, but then uh-huh. that's so sad because then you're like sh- sometimes it feels like then you have to like ship all by yourself yeah you know? because you're like oh i Which, can't like... say anything for god's sake yeah <laughs> oh lord <laughs> well i could chat with you all day because this is so fun um but we'll start wrapping it up can you let people know like do you have any projects articles anything coming up you want people to know about 
Um, you know, I, like you've said, I, I do write at Telltale TV and Fangirlish um, and would love for you to check out my reviews. I'm reviewing I Feel Bad at Fangirlish and it's, it's, I Feel Bad is pretty bad, um, yeah. but hopefully my reviews are entertaining. <laughs> yeah. And, um, and then I'm reviewing Crazy Ex-Girlfriend over at Telltale, Telltale TV right now. But I think that um, I would say just to be on the lookout for um, voting. I don't know uh, when this will air, yeah. but you know, that's something that's uh, just so important and yeah. is kind of on my mind right now is just how we have our voice um, and in the creation of the story of our, of this country and of, um, yeah. you know, other countries um, just is really going to be impacted by this midterm election. Absolutely. Yeah. This, this, um, this episode is going to go out on Halloween on Wednesday. Oh, yep. So Perfect. you will still have time to vote. And mm-hmm. I always say, like, what I think is I'm a huge political geek. That's my mm. professional educational background and everything. Voting is not sufficient, but it is sure as hell necessary. Do you have anything else you want to tell people as far as where to find you? What's your Twitter handle? My Twitter's, Twitter handle is at schools outlaw. And the podcast that I do is at three, the number three sipping sisters. That's pretty much it. Cool. Well, thank (laughs) you so much again. It was so much fun geeking out with you Mm -hmm. and chatting with you. Um, I guess not face to face, but Skype to Skype. (laughs) It counts. So cool. All right. So thank you so much. Thank you so much for joining us today. Since we are podcast newbies, it would mean a lot to us if you'd subscribe and rate us on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. Also, we love to hear from our listeners. Leave us a voicemail at 785-746-2604. Email us at ask, A-S-K, at geekygirlguide.com. Or hit us up on social media at geekygirlguide, all one word, on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. And remember, in the words of the great John Barrowman, never apologize for being nerdy. Until next time.